Perfect Victims, 1988. The movie opens with a failed attempt from Sticky Jeans here to grab business casual as she wanders down a dimly lit street when a friend just so happens by and swoops her up in the nick of time to give her a ride back home. Having failed to do whatever he was about to do, Creeper calls it a night, running over the audience as he speeds off. We become born-again helicopters during a flying day shot following a dangerously slow-moving jeep on the freeway filled with two pretty girls, Melissa and Carrie, as they make their way to a job interview. Despite having no headshots, resumes, very little work experience, and being late to the meeting, they both manage to land the job in a shared interview in less than two minutes. Not bad, or normal for a large modeling company in the middle of LA. Meanwhile, at their new apartment, the landlord, Mrs. Feldman, lets a couple of furniture movers in and we get badly red herringed when one of them, Raul, is reprimanded by the other, Brandon, for rummaging through the client's things. So while the audience is thinking something's wrong with Raul, Brandon takes the headshot for himself, then strangely starts messing with a jug of milk in the fridge. Later that day at some sushi restaurant, we get to see another strikeout, this time with Liz, the modeling agency owner from before, and her boyfriend Steven, as he sloppily proposes to her for the umpteenth time over the grossest plate of sushi Liz has ever seen. Across town, Melissa and Carrie are getting ready for an evening at home, randomly spouting unnecessary dialogue about baby exposition here when they decide to celebrate their new jobs by sitting around in their underwear, eating cookies with milk, smoking a joint, and watching shampoo commercials on TV. Creeper truck from earlier pulls up and outsteps the furniture mover Brandon, clumsily stumbling into the bushes in front of the girl's living room window, and in the process, nearly getting ID'd by Neighborhood Watch as they take their dog out to ruin someone's lawn. That weed they're smoking must be good, because Carrie's out, ass up on the floor while Melissa ends up falling in the hallway trying to get the back door open because she thinks there must be a gas leak somewhere with how high they are. Suddenly a hand smashes through the window on the back door, cutting itself on the glass, and Brandon enters the house wearing a cheap plastic mask. He wraps his wound with a piece of cloth before scooping up Melissa, bringing her into the front room with Carrie, where he force feeds everyone pixie sticks and whips out a Polaroid camera to cherish the moment. After ripping her shirt open, Brandon takes the wound on his arm and strangely drips blood across Melissa's face before turning his attention to Carrie, propping her up on the couch and proceeding to rape her. A random phone call interrupts the attack, resulting in Brandon getting spooked and quickly throwing his clothes back on before vowing to return like some early morning cartoon villain as he taunts the girls on the way out. The next day, Liz arrives at Steven's place when she's cornered by his two dogs, Deus Ex Machina and Foreshadow, but they're quickly sent to the holding area of unused plot devices because back at just another day in LA, on her way to take out the remaining part of her ex-husband's corpse to the can, the landlord hears baby not a real character screaming and decides to check it out, only to find a back door worse than one man one jar. The women are rushed to the hospital and Liz is for some reason notified about what's happened, deciding to race down to the emergency room with Steven as the main detective on the case, Lieutenant White, finds out labeling rape victims babbling cokeheads is a little premature, so he excuses himself and returns back to the precinct to start the investigation with his partner, Detective Easy Target. Possibly somewhere in the future, but who knows, this movie doesn't seem very conscious of time. Brandon is seen flipping through channels as he comes across an interview with Liz on some local news station about the incident. I'm not exactly sure why she was picked to give an interview, as she only knew the girls for about two minutes, and half the time spent with them was being interrupted by her secretary about unrelated scheduling issues. But I guess that's enough to be an authority on someone in this universe. Brandon gets upset about being called a sick animal, which sets him off into smashing his television with a golf trophy he's been busy stroking in his lap for some reason, saying that she just doesn't get it. In all honesty, neither do I. Anyway, back at Fisher Price Detective Agency, Lieutenant White and his partner are trying to sound out words when they realize this crime has happened before, and the drug used was the same tranquilizer from another recent case when the lab calls in about the results from the blood on the window. Everything gets all overdramatic as it's announced 
the perpetrator has AIDS. We cut to Brandon sitting at a bar, scoping out his next victim drinking with some friends when he orders a similar drink and sends it over. She reluctantly accepts the drink, and minutes later the friends take off, leaving the girl there all alone so the plot can continue. Within a scene dissolved, she begins to feel weird and up to use the bathroom. Not sure how Brandon managed to drug the drink without someone seeing it or get the waitress to accept giving someone a drink that someone else had in their possession, but apparently it worked, and he quickly escorts the drugged girl outside the bar to the beach. Once outside, and I mean that literally a few feet from the entrance of the packed bar they were just at, he decides, eh, it's far enough, backhands her like Nishikori into the sand, and begins to rape her on the beach. And after that, she somehow ends up laying in the middle of some highway road with a car almost running her over, obviously in a completely different location from where she was. Somewhere else now, Lieutenant White is busy listening to a veterinarian make obvious excuses for their addiction as they shoot up a chimp with drugs, saying they once experienced an accidental injection of the animal tranquilizer in question, and its symptoms match what was experienced by the raped women. The next day, Liz, obviously very interested in the health of these women she just met for a few minutes, is informed by the doctor about the potential of the models contracting AIDS from what's happened, even before they had a chance to know about the possibility themselves, and is told not to say anything when she goes to visit them. Talk about a breach of patient-doctor confidentiality. Meanwhile, Raul and Brandon are on their way to another job together when Raul notices that the newspaper has stupidly published the address of rape victims in their paper and is the same address of the models they just got done moving in a couple of days ago, prompting Brandon to irrationally freak out and grab the paper, throwing it out the window of the truck. On the phone with Steven, Liz tells him that she doesn't want to be left alone tonight, but Steven has a meeting to get to, so she decides to go to her office and pick up some things before heading home to waste some time. But outside Liz's office, Brandon has apparently used his tingly rape sense teleportation powers to blip over to the modeling agency and wait outside for Liz on the off chance she would drive by so he could follow her inside and get some information by checking her car as she goes upstairs. He conveniently finds a note we don't get to understand the information that's written on it, but the movie acts like it's a gotcha moment, so it must be important, and off he goes to enact a plan. Later that day at the moving company's private locker room for employees, Raul invites Brandon out to go to some club with him, but Brandon already has a date. So the boss calls Brandon over the loudspeaker to the office so he can sign his time card he forgot while Raul looks for his Zippo to light his cigarette, but his lighter is run dry. Figuring Brandon has something, he sneakily goes to his locker before he gets back and ends up finding Brandon's drug tube and the headshot of the two models from earlier, but doesn't realize Brandon came back and has noticed him looking through his things from the doorway. Eventually, Raul goes to leave, but Brandon ominously stands in his way to offer him some foreshadowing for his cigarette. I mean a light. Liz arrives home and gets ready to take a bubble bath and wind down after all the butting in she's done today, when we notice Brandon has apparently already broken in and is currently hiding in the closet, waiting to jump out as soon as Liz opens the door. When she bypasses the closet and gets into the bathtub, Brandon decides to make his move, but a creaky floorboard alerts Liz to someone might be in the house. Instead of simply attacking her right then and there, Brandon slasher teleports away as Liz gets out of the tub and notices the closet door open, but thinks nothing of it, and goes to make her way into the hallway where Brandon has decided to ridiculously stand there, waiting for her to open the door so he can jump scare her. A struggle ensues and Brandon is kicked in the balls, then tased to the floor before Liz runs downstairs where Stephen feels left out and also jump scares her as he gets home. She tells him someone's upstairs, so Stephen goes to investigate, but Brandon has already fled the scene out the window. Lieutenant White, being the only detective on staff apparently, arrives on scene and Liz tries to tell him someone was in the house and he wants to kill her but Steven feels she needs to stop giving information because she looks distraught and needs to stay at his house for a few days to recover. Yep, good idea. Let's waste more time because you have a marriage boner and can't wait. 
So a taxi pulls up outside a hotel as Raul and a hooker he met at the show get out drunk as hell, making their way to a room for the night and party it up with a bit of a nightcap. Once inside, the hooker pulls out a bottle of alcohol from the top of some shelf with a playful giggle and a mouthful of spirits, spits it all over Raul's face, which he seems relatively unfazed by, thinking it's some sort of kink she's into as she skips off to the bathroom under the guise of needing to go pee. However, again, Brandon has set all this up with his amazing godlike slasher powers and is currently hiding in the shower, waiting for them to show up and make his grand entrance where his ominous use of words from earlier can come true as he lights Raul on fire, even framing the hooker for it and making her instantly die from a stab wound to the stomach. It seems, however, Brandon didn't count on the power of Neighborhood Watch and the fact that they drank their carrot juice this morning, so they were able to make their way to the station and give Lieutenant Every Cop on the Force an exact depiction of Brandon's creeper truck down to the color of the license plate numbers for their first official break in the case. Go Team Geritol. Now that Steven did all he could to get Liz to stay at his place short of kidnapping her, he has to go off and conveniently spend all day at a meeting, leaving her home, but not by herself. He's allowed Carrie and Melissa to stay over there with Baby Not Important, so Godkiller Brandon can have all his victims in one place tonight, when he obviously shows up to attack them again, instead of doing the smart thing and simply going after someone else that isn't currently being watched by the police. Who am I kidding? Watched by the police. The police aren't even sure where Steven's house is. They aren't even watching Liz's place or the original victims Carrie and Melissa's place to see if Brandon will come back. But come back he does when Liz for some reason goes to work, Brandon conveniently knows she's there and calls her up to threaten her. Even when Liz goes to pick everybody up to come over and spend the night, Brandon's there too, and is just sitting there in his truck that everyone's apparently looking for, right in plain view of the entire street. A short time later, Liz and Melissa are downstairs taking care of baby nobody, while Carrie is in the shower upstairs, breaking down in tears from the shame of what she's endured, weak from the medication she's on. So yes, of course, Liz decides this is the most convenient time to leave everyone to go get food from the grocery store because nobody thought anything through beforehand. And guess what? She's attacked and captured by Brandon in the parking lot, with absolutely nobody seeing him do it. Again! He even manages to take Liz hostage at knife point, leaving his truck behind to advance the plot, and show up at Steven's house to threaten Melissa into preparing the knockout drink, so he can apparently still rape and give everybody, I, I don't know, double AIDS or something? Even though I figure the whole rape and AIDS thing is well beyond them at this point with how far things have gone, but I guess it's still a completely viable plan somehow. Although one thing the movie can't stand by and allow is for Carrie's baby to finally get acknowledged she exists and is more than just a MacGuffin with the slightest bit of meaning to the story when Brandon randomly wants to use the tranquilizer to shut it up, willing to bypass the main reason he's here, allowing Lissa to grab the garage door opener and release the dogs. Deus Ex Machina and Foreshadow come flying through the window like Rin Tin Tin and attack Brandon as he makes his way up the stairs to the baby, just as Steven gets home with a cop. The cop tells Steven to call off the dogs, noticing a little blood on Brandon's face as he lies motionless at the foot of the stairs, so that must mean he's dead and makes stupidly turning his back to radio the station without cuffing or even checking the body a good idea, which earns him a gash across the neck. Brandon tries to flee out the door and across the yard to the tennis courts, but Lieutenant Everywhere appears and puts a couple of rounds into Brandon as his body goes limp over the tennis court net, prompting one of the stupidest one-liners I've heard in a very, very long time. Apparently there were many more pictures of Brandon's victims discovered in a locker or portable closet in his apartment, and supposedly Carrie and Melissa never did contract AIDS, but this is where the movie ends for me. That dumbass tennis-themed one-liner. What a trash fire. 
This movie was a serious chore to sit through with how asinine the choices each character made. The victims were trying their hardest to remain victims, and the rapist was just a weirdo with an extremely lucky streak that like bordered on fourth wall breaking script knowledge and magic powers. The acting was pretty decent from some of the actors for the most part, but the writing was severely lacking in every possible way, and I know it must have been hard trying to make this garbage sound believable. Brandon's motivation and needs vary drastically from one scene to the next, wanting people to die by suffering the slow, agonizing way he believes AIDS will bring them, to simply killing people without question just because he can. And he never really has a true roadmap of what he's trying to accomplish. To me, he was the weakest link in this film chain with his terrible acting, and it probably didn't help. He was obviously poorly written and directed. Anyway, the end. <laughs>